welcome, 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 welcome to Drama Mama. This is a segment of my show where uh, basically we try to get to the bottom of internet dramas. We try to figure out exactly what's going on, get all of the receipts. We love our receipts. And then we try to make, uh, you know, an impartial analysis that results uh, in us being able to make a conclusion and so that you can be, you know, caught up and in the loop. You don't have to feel like you're left out or anything like that. It's really great. And today, we have a really special drama. One that's been many years in the making. So we have a lot of receipts to bring out. And this drama is all about a guy named Joss Whedon. Okay? If you're here and you're excited for this, consider popping down and smacking the subscribe bell and the like button. All of those really help us. We'd love to have you join us here at the Demon Mama Show, where you can get all kinds of fucking sick-ass stuff. Uh, swears, sex jokes, uh, drama, um, politics, all of it. It's all here, including uh, what we're about to talk about now, which unfortunately is basically only like two of those things. You know. So, uh, Joss Whedon. Who is Joss Whedon? Have you ever heard of a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer? No. Have you ever heard of a show called Dollhouse? Definitely no. Have you ever heard of a show called Firefly? Have you ever heard of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Have you ever heard of the Justice League? If you've ever heard of any one of those things, if you, if you go, I recognize that when I said one of those things, then you actually probably are familiar with Joss Whedon, even if you don't know it. Joss Whedon... Um, is a very influential writer, director, producer in current, uh, in, in the sort of, uh, the current, uh, uh, blockbuster, um, Hollywood scene. Yeah, a lot of people really liked, uh, fucking a lot of people loved Buffy, a lot of people love, uh, you know, Serenity, um, all these other things. <laughs> Whedon is familiar with your toes, that's his true career. Um, yeah, more, well, yeah, basically. Uh, if you've never seen what Joss Whedon looks like, he looks like this, which is, you know, about what you would expect um, for a guy who uh, more or less defined the, as you can see, we're, we're, we're in a bit of a time portal today. We're going back to 2015. But uh, in 2015, it was kind of the apex of this whole, like, uh, the, the soy facing, uh, like, oh my god, Cthulhu, ooh, spaceship, sci-fi, I just, I'm not like the other boys, I like Star Trek. That type of, like, pop culture, ooh, look at my Funko Pop collection, I just love Rick and Morty. Like, that kind of shit. That was, like, it was at its peak in 2015. I don't even think, I don't even know if Rick and Morty was fucking running at that time. But it's the same attitude. It's the same fucking thing. And, uh, and it kind of makes sense, you know that this guy was kind of responsible for all of that, you know? Yeah, Cthulhu, Bacon, Nyan, Cat. Yep. It was, uh, yeah, it was monstrous. Yeah, everybody's telling me, yeah, all the memories are coming back. That's why I said we're going into a time portal tonight on Drama Mama, a double time portal, and it's not been fun. Our minds have been, have, have been scathed and scraped. But the good news about a brain scraping is that afterwards, you're able to think a little bit more clearly than you were before because you scraped off all of the stuff you didn't want in there, right? That's how it works. That's why, you know, brain shaving. Everybody does that. Anyway, let's continue. <clears throat> so, okay. Joss Whedon. Guy's got a huge career, right? He's, he's, this guy's in, got his hands in, in leadership position in basically all of the, of the most popular media franchises of the last 10 years. This guy's been all over DC. He's been all over Marvel. He's had his shows all over the TV, movie after movie after movie. This guy's everywhere. Joss Whedon, Joss Whedon, Joss Whedon. Everybody's always talking about Joss Whedon, and they're like, oh, he's directing a new film. And it's kind of funny because, like, Joss Whedon was, like, for a long time hailed. I'm, I'm not kidding you. This is going to sound incredibly cringe, and some of you who didn't witness this are not going to believe it, and you're especially not going to believe it at the end of this episode. However, um, for quite a while, um, it was, like, considered, like, if you were a Joss Whedon fan, that was, like, it was, like, a feminist virtue point, like, unironically. Like, people would be like, oh, Joss Whedon, he writes stories with strong female characters, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and River from Serenity. It was 
really painful period of time to be alive at, you know, just horrible. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, it was, it was miserable. And, and, and if you thought you would have escaped unscathed, you wouldn't have everybody. It was bad. Okay. It was a bad period. Okay. He was, yeah, he was coasting off of Buffy having like a female main character for his entire life. But guys, as it turns out, Joss Whedon is actually a giant piece of shit. Wow. Um, and, uh, everybody's known this for a fucking long time and he just somehow keeps going on and on and on mostly because he has cozied up to studio executives who have protected him and who he, you know, ensures keeps making money. I think when we talk about strong female characters, I don't think we're talking about physically strong. Well, some people are, yes. Some, some people literally are. That's how they understand gender. They're like, wow, a woman with muscles? That's illegal. That's their, like, total understanding. And so when they see that, it's like a, a life-changing revelation. And then forever, for the rest of their life, they can't jack off to anything but muscular women, you know, after they watched Buffy one time. Oh, I you, you think people mean just, like, well-written? Well, yeah, but never mind. Um, look, not, none of this is relevant, Okay. The fact is that Joss Whedon has had a lot of allegations against him. We actually covered this a couple of times in the past. Um, if you go onto my channel and you search Drama Mama, you will actually see that Joss Whedon's name has come up multiple times. And the reason for that is because it keeps getting worse. It keeps getting worse. Every single day that goes by, it seems, there's something worse coming out about Joss Whedon. So for those who don't know, I'm going to give you a quick summary of a previous Drama Mama that we did, which was covering Joss Whedon's involvement um, in Buffy and his involvement on the set of the DC films. Now, needless to say, Joss Whedon has a lot of issues with his actors, particularly female actors. Like, as in, he's notorious for having a bad time getting along with them. And over time, it has revealed that that's actually not really what was going on, but that instead, he was an insufferable creep uh, who constantly, constantly violated boundaries, constantly violated con consent, and even perved on a 14-year-old child actress on Buffy, who fucking hates his guts now. All of this was revealed in previous Drama Mamas where we went over all of the receipts and came to this conclusion. If you want to go find out about that stuff, some of that will be mentioned here, but all the receipts, all of the uh, the claims, all of the cross-references, we did that all in a previous Drama Mama. You can check out on the Drama Mama playlist on my channel, but we're not talking about that directly today. Instead, we're talking about the latest installment in this whole Joss Whedon nonsense. Because as it turns out, Joss Whedon, in an attempt, what appears to be an attempt by him to recoup his public image, agreed to a, uh, to a, a sort of tell-all interview. And let me tell you, he told all and he told on himself. Can we get a, uh, can we get a sus here? Boom, 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 boom. Can we get a, like a, a sus? I need, I need my soundboard back. We need a fucking sus right here. Cause boy, oh boy, was it a self-report. Just a, just a, oh my God. And we're going to read that article because there's really no better way to do it than to read it together and then talk about it afterwards. And we can go and we can talk about all the shit that this guy's been working on. Um, and, and, and how he's turned basically every single film set that he works on into a nightmare for almost everyone involved, but mostly for women. And, and it's funny because in our last little, in our last drama mama, those of you, uh, who aren't watching this live, will have to go back and watch the other one to catch this conversation. We did talk extensively about, uh, sexism in STEM and how the problem is really bad. The environment is so hostile that people just don't like, like women don't like being in STEM, not because they don't like doing the work, but because they can't stop getting 
harassed, uh, sexually assaulted, mistreated, talked down to. That actually drives you away from a field, obviously. Anybody would have that reaction. And the problem is so bad in entertainment as well. What STEM? Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Am a woman in STEM can confirm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's bad. It's fucking bad. Um, the toxic bra culture is in tech. Yeah, there's 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 all kinds of versions of this. Um, but there are some industries that stand out above others. You know, we covered the Blizzard Activision situation, which is just, whew, wow, holy fuck, that is a disaster. Uh, and now we're talking about the entertainment. We're talking about the film entertainment industry. And then we also have talked about STEM. This is a, a huge problem. And over the last couple of years, it's become particularly prevalent of, a, of an issue that people are talking about, which is a good thing, um, even if it can get a little bit uh, exhausting, realizing how much of this is, is actually going on um, constantly in these industries. Um, we've had... You know, over the last 10 years, there's been the Me Too movement, um, which like huge implicated like like Harvey Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein, who was who was a, a absolute kingpin of of production in Hollywood, ran one of the most powerful production houses and the entire time for years used the power and money from that position. The influence that you have being the deciding guy for one of the biggest uh, production houses in Hollywood that using that power to be able to abuse the people who worked underneath him, specifically women. It's, uh, it's bad. So what I wanted to do here real quick, um, is read this article, um, that was just, uh, that was just published a couple of days ago. And, um, it's called the undoing of Joss Whedon. Okay. There's, oh, oh, Copioid Crisis says, there is currently a big Me Too action going on in the Netherlands. The production firm of the Dutch, The Voice, for years. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the problem is that, mo that many other countries built their uh, entertainment industry on the exact, in the exact same way that Hollywood was built, in the exact same uh, hyper, hyper hierarchicalized, hyper patriarchal structures are in place in many other countries as well. It's going to be a long, hard battle to try and break that shit down. And part of it is taking a look into some of the people who've managed and how the people that have been the prime uh, enablers and also perpetrators of abuse, how they got to where they were and the way that they moved in the spaces. Not a girl, Joss. Defo's not a girl, Joss. No, 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 no. So here we go. Let's begin the article. We're going to read this together. It's a big article, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. And we're going to stop to talk about stuff, etc. It's been a while since we've done like an article reading segment, but I think it's a good one. Okay? The Undoing of Joss Whedon. The Buffy creator, once an icon of Hollywood feminism. Do you see what I said? Do you, Can you... This dude... I told you. Once an icon of Hollywood feminism. Ridiculous but nonetheless, it was the way it was, is now an at outcast accused of misogyny. How did he get here? He's not accused of misogyny, by the way. I know they're being nice because this is the headline. He's accused of rape, sexual assault, uh, uh, like racist discrimination. Yeah, not, not, miso not misogyny. That's not the main accusation there. You, you're burying it just a little bit. Whatever. In the fall of 2002, 160 scholars convened at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. They were an eclectic group, theologians, philosophers, linguists, film professors, and they had descended on a medieval city for a conference dedicated to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a cult television show about a teenage girl who fights monsters while attending school in Southern California. It was not a typical academic gathering. There were life-size cutouts of the eponymous heroine, as well as Buffy-themed chocolates, action figures, and in the welcome bags, exfoliating moisturizers. Buffy the Backside Slayer. Wow. 
Uh, Professor stalked around in long black leather cloaks like the vampire Spike, Buffy's enemy and later her lover. If the line between scholarship and fandom was vanishingly thin, so was the line between fandom and worship. On the first morning of the conference, David Lavery, a professor of English at Middle Tennessee State University, stood at the podium and declared the show's creator, Joss Whedon, the avatar of a new religion, the founder of a new faith. Yeah, um, just so you guys know, just we're going to take a, a short second there. I'm just going to take a, a short second there. Um, you know, sometimes stream people talk about parasociality because of the, the like, nature of how streams go. I just want you to know, just so you know, the parasocial shit, you know that term was invented in the 1950s, and it had to do with television stars, music stars, television producers, celebrity culture. Yeah, that never went anywhere it's just still here yeah king of comedy yeah king of comedy fucking shit weird parasocial uh obsession avatar of a new religion the founder of a new faith fucking joss whedon joss joss fucking whedon. focus let's do this Lavery and two other professors would go on to establish the whedon studies association an organization devoted to expanding the field of buffy scholarship as Lavery would write in the introduction to a book he co-authored on the series, Whedon had not simply composed a narrative about struggle against the forces of darkness, vampires, demons, monsters of all variety. He had taken a stand against a panoply of oppressive social forces, most obviously the forces of gender stereotyping. According to the prevailing rules of Hollywood horror at the time, Whedon's protagonist, a hot blonde with a dumb name, should have died with the, within the opening scenes. But Whedon had flipped the genre on its head and endowing her with superhuman powers and a hero's journey. Real revolutionary shit here, guys. Now look, I know a lot of you out here probably liked Buffy, okay? So I need to tell I need you to hold your breath for one second. Defuse your hackles, okay? Unpin your venom sacks or whatever, okay? Buffy, not that good, okay? It's all right. It's fine, okay? It's fine. It's entertaining. But guess what? There has been media, there has and is currently media with female leads that is not only more entertaining, but more emotionally moving and more intellectually valuable than anything that Joss Whedon has ever created. So I just... I know there's a lot, there's an instinct to be like, well, yeah, but like there wasn't much on TV at the time. That is not praise of Joss Whedon. That is an indictment of how fucking stupid American television programming is. Okay. That's, that's what that is. That is not, that should not be seen as praise of Joss Whedon who had the, who had the courage to have woman in movie. And also, of course, Joss Whedon didn't make the shows by himself, although he would tell you basically that he did. We're going to get there, though. Anyway, just remember that, everybody. There is, was, and always has been, even if it's a little harder to find, media that scratches the itch that you're looking for better than you could possibly imagine. Okay? This shit is, is, this shit you've been eating dog food. Okay? You've been eating dog food your whole life. And all you have to do is reach out of your comfort zone and you'll find crazy awesome stuff, okay? Films, books, video games. Let's continue. It wasn't just scholars who worshipped him in those days. He was a celebrity showrunner before anyone cared who even ran shows. In 2005, the comic book artist Scott R. Kurtz designed a t-shirt that gestured at, we at Whedon's stature in popular culture at the time. Joss Whedon is my master now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, I'm gonna die from cringe. I'm gonna die. I'm- Oh, I can't do it. My cringe organs. Oh. I don't have enough. I don't have enough chat. Oh, the only thing that can keep me going is subscribing and liking and throwing and showering me in donations. That's it. Otherwise, my org- my cringe organs gonna give out. Let's continue. Marvel later put him in charge of its biggest franchise, hiring him to write and direct 2012's The Avengers and its sequel, Age of Ultron. 
two of the highest grossing films of all time. By the way, Age of Ultron sucked. Shut the fuck up, that movie blew. His fans thought of him as a feminist ally, an impression bolstered by his fundraising efforts for progressive causes. Um... But in recent years, the good guy image has been tarnished by a series of accusations, each more damaging than the last. In 2017, his ex-wife, Kai Cole, published a sensational open letter about him on the movie blog The Rap. She condemned him as a hypocrite fe preaching feminist ideals and accused him of cheating on her throughout her marriage, including with actresses on the set of Buffy. This is what we covered before, which you can go watch the whole thing, okay? You can go watch that if you want to. We talked about this multiple times. Then, beginning in the summer of 2020, the actors Ray Fisher and Gal Gadot, who had starred in a super film, superhero film directed by Whedon, claimed that he'd mistreating them, mistreated them, with Fisher describing his behavior as gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable. They were soon joined by Charisma Carpenter, who played Cordelia on Buffy and in its, and its spin-off series, Angel. In a long Twitter post, she wrote that Whedon had a history of being casually cruel. After she became pregnant, heading into Angel's fourth season, he called her fat to colleagues and summoned her into his office to ask, as she recalled, if she was going to keep it, referring to her baby. She claimed she, he had mocked her religious beliefs, accused her of sabotaging the show, and fired her a season later once she had given birth. All the joy of new motherhood had been sucked right out, she, she wrote, and Joss was the vampire. Now, this is a very, very brief summary, but just so you know, we go into the full details of this, and Cordelia's, uh, sorry, uh, Charisma Carpenter, who played Cordelia, her claims are very, very, they are very well backed up, and other people on the set also say, they also corroborate her story. Additionally, they don't say this, but Joss Whedon would make her work extreme hours. And this was confirmed by other people on the set while she was pregnant. So she gets pregnant and Joss is mad because she won't get rid of the baby for his show. And so he makes her work grueling hours. Ridiculous. And that's what is not summarized here which we talk about in the other video. Anyway, let's continue. Carpenter's comments threw the fandom into crisis. Fan organizations debated changing their names. People on discussion sites wrote anguished posts um, as, as Sarah Michelle Gellar, who played the titular Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, and other Buffy stars offered words of support for Carpenter online. Again, this is, this is really, really, really um, shrinking it down. It wasn't just the actress who played Buffy. It was almost every other woman on the set said that they had had similar experiences um, to the point that, uh, actually, I actually don't even know if they're going to talk about it. One of, the, um, one of the actresses said that when she was younger, there, that, uh, that, she had, that there was multiple points where Joss Whedon was making moves on her to the point that her agent s would tell her to never be in the same room alone with Joss Whedon. Like, it's ridiculous. It's just out of control. So this is a bit, this is a bit summarized, you know. The community's sense of shock and betrayal could be seen in part as an indictment of the culture of fandom itself. True. Uh, as fans, we have a bad habit of deifying those whose work we respect. Kurtz, the comic book artist, told me, when you build these people up so big, they have nowhere to go but down. I don't know why we're surprised when they turn out to be fallible humans who fall. Okay, this is not a fall, okay? Like, I see what this guy's trying to say here, but this isn't a fall. This is people ignoring and deifying him regardless of shit that was known to be going on. It's not a matter of him having a fall. He didn't make a mistake. Joss Whedon has been doing this for his entire career. So, I think this is a really stupid thing to say in this particular aspect. Like, obviously, we know there's problems with fandom. But this isn't just that problem. The, the fandom problem here, like, the fans, many of the fans couldn't have known about the stuff that was going on on the sets. Because they're not involved in that process, and people had been silenced about it. It's really, really nice here. 
This past spring, Whedon invited me to spend a couple of afternoons with him at his home in Los Angeles. By then, I had spoken with dozens of people who knew him. After months of agonizing over whether to grant my request for an interview, he decided to talk. Whedon, 57, lives in Santa Monica, 13 blocks from the ocean, on a street lined with magnolia trees and $5 million homes. His house, his house is open, airy, modern. He sat hunched over on a black leather couch, his fingers clicking together, the thumbs tapping each of the other digits in quick succession whenever the conversation shifted towards his recent troubles. Pale and angular, with back bags under his eyes, he no longer much resembled the plump-cheeked Puck, who was once impishly urged a profile writer to describe him as doughy and jowly. It was a perfect day in Santa Monica, as almost every day in Santa Monica is, but Whedon wanted to stay inside. Gazing through a wall of glass at his lush backyard, he announced in his quiet rumble of a voice that he was thinking of getting curtains. The sun is my enemy. <laughs> oh no, dude! I told you! I told you! He thought this was going to be good for him. Oh no! The worst thing. Okay, guys, let me tell you. The worst thing you can do. If you're trying to improve your image with the public, the first thing you want to do is not go <laughs> at the sun when somebody walks in, okay? I'm just I'm just saying right now that like hissing and crying at the sight of the sun in your first interview trying to prove that you're not like a vampiric monster is like a really really bad that's a really bad first start. Scattered around the room were paintings by his wife, the artist Heather Horton. They got married in February 2021, just after the wave of allegations had crested. At the sound of the garage door opening, his shoulders react, re relaxed. Heather's coming back, he said. She breezed through the room in a sundress and complimented me on my glasses. Then she was gone. Picking up a cup of tea, Whedon said he could no longer remain silent as people tried to pry his legacy from his hands. But there was a problem. The, those people had set out to destroy him and would surely seize on his every utterance in an attempt to finish the job. I'm terrified, he said, of every word that comes out of my mouth. Oh, boy. There's a, there's a thing here. This is literally what this is right here. Saying that... Okay, listen. It's this right here. If I speak, I am in, in big trouble. <laughs> in big trouble. And I don't... <laughs> that moment right there. If I speak, I'm in uh, big trouble. I'm in really big trouble. So I just prefer not to speak. Straight up, that's this. I'm terrified of every word that comes out of my mouth. Straight up. If I speak, I I, I prefer not to speak. Because if I speak, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Back when he was still a god, the kind that is contractually obligated to promote network television shows at press junkets, Whedon was asked over and over to explain why he wrote the stories about strong women. For years, he would answer by talking about his mother, Lee Stearns, who died in 1991, who was an activist and an unpublished novelist who taught history at an elite private school in the Bronx. One of her students, Jessica Neuwirth, went on to become the co-founder of Equality Now, an organization that promotes women's rights. Neuwirth, who has cited Stearns as an inspiration, described her to me as a visionary feminist. In 2006, Equality Now presented Whedon with an award at an evening dedicated to honoring men on the front lines of feminism. In his speech, Whedon referred to his mother as extraordinary, inspirational, tough, cool, and sexy. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen. Look. This is one of those moments where if it was anybody but Joss Whedon, you might be like, okay, maybe he's just goofing. But it's Joss Whedon. In that context, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight. You know what he was saying about his dead mother, right? Yeah, anyway. Oh, boy, here we go. Sitting in his living room, he told me he sees a different side of her now. She was a remarkable woman and an inspiring person, he said. But sometimes those are hard people to be raised by. Mm. Whedon had been thinking a lot about his childhood. He had been in therapy for the past few years, ever since he checked himself into an addiction treatment center in Florida for a month-long stay. As a younger man, he had channeled his pain into his work, but he was never particularly interested in picking apart the stories he always told himself about this past. Now he didn't have much else to do. The allegations against him had led to friends to stop calling. He was out of work and wasn't writing. 
What story would he even tell? There were things about his life he was only beginning to understand. Not the things being said in the press necessarily, but things I'm not comfortable with. I'm like, I have nothing going on. I can do some work on me. Oh my God. He really thought, he really thought this piece was going to make him look good. That he'd be like, yeah, you know, all these people are out there to destroy me. So I took a journey inward and I decided to, to, to blame my mom for everything. Cause you know, I'm just a tortured artist, man. Oh my God. Born Joseph. Joss Whedon grew up in a Palazzo style apartment building on the Upper West Side. The family spent holidays reading Shakespeare out loud and evenings listening to Sondheim with friends. There wasn't a grown up who didn't have a drink in their hand by mid afternoon, he said. His father, Tom, was a second generation television writer whose credits included The Golden Girls and The Dick Cavett Show. He had lived through many writer's rooms battles, and he and Lee ran the home as though they were in the thick of one. If you weren't funny or entertaining or agreeing with them, they would cut you down or turn to stone, he recalled. Whedon was the youngest of three boys, soft and slight and anxious. He had long red hair that caused people to mistake him for a girl, which he says he didn't mind. He identified with the feminine, a testament maybe to his connection with his mother. She was capricious and withholding, but she frightened him less than his father and especially his brothers, admirable monsters who bullied the shit out of him. Oh my God. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I need to take a breather. This is just drip. Uh, what? It, remember before when I was joking? about how I said, I'm not like the other guys. I like Star Trek and I, I believe in feelings. Did Remember when I said that and I was joking and we hadn't read this yet and I haven't read this yet. This is a fresh re react. And I said, that's what he was doing. And now he's doing that now. He was like, he's like, when I was a kid, well, I just, I just realized how much assholes other guys are, you know? Not like me, baby, you know? I know the appreciation of a strong blonde woman named Bimboni. That's what I love. You know, I love that shit. I love me a strong woman. I'm not like those other guys, you know? I, I, somebody, somebody called me a wimp once because I had long hair. I, I, you know, I really get the feminine experience. I get it, you know? I really get it. Now, fuck me. I really get it. Now, if you don't fuck me, I'm going to ruin your life, you know, because I'm not like those other guys and I deserve your attention. I, I'm, I'm like a hero. I deserve it. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm going to lose my shit. This is so fucking cringe. On weekends and in the summers, he would pass his mornings pacing the long driveway of the family's second home, a farmhouse near Schenectady, making up science fiction universes or plotting elaborate revenge on my brother's. Whedon now has a term for the damage his childhood caused. He says he suffers from CPTSD. Oh my God. Oh, sorry, everybody guys. Sorry. I, sorry. I sexually exploited uh, people for 25 years in the industry. It was my CPTSD acting up. It's my CPTSD acting up guys. That's why, that's why I had to, abuse a bunch of people that's why i had to vengefully force a pregnant woman to work uh, longer hours than anybody else oh my god that's why i had to uh p creep on a child and possibly even molest a child allegations which are yet unproven but nonetheless believable let's put it that way oh my god so bad a condition that can uh, he says he suffers from CPTSD, a condition that can lead to relationship problems, a self-destructive behavior, and addictions of various kinds. I asked if he would be willing to share his most traumatic memory with me. I'm going to run to the loo, he said. Later, he would let slip that someone advised him to pretend he needed to pee if he felt uncomfortable with a question. Returning to the couch, he affected a sort of Vincent Price voice. And now, tales of horror and woe. Oh my god. He literally was like, well, that happened. By the way, if you hate the comedy of like Marvel movies where they were like, what? I can explain. Whoa, I spilled my drink. And then somebody comes in and goes, well, that happened. And then they go in and go, there's an explosion. And somebody goes, yikes, bro. That is like the, the fucking definition 
of Joss Whedon's writing. He writes all of his shows with these stupid, quippy, dumb one-liners that are just, oh God, it's so bad. And to, to, to oh God, you're, you're doing an interview with somebody who is asking you about the mountain of sexual, uh, uh, sexual misbehavior allegations against you. And you just come in and go, and now, tales of, of horror and woe. <laughs> well, that just happened. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, it's so cringe. As someone with CPTSD, I hate, hate, hate people who use it as an excuse to be horrible. That's true about everything. That's true about any of these things. You Struggling with something can help people understand you as a par process of working together as a process of, of, of learning yourself, but it can never excuse your actions. If you hurt somebody, you hurt them. Even if you made the wrong decision, you have to admit that. You can't just excuse, especially like long-term patterns of behavior. Oh, I had CPS, PTSD. Yeah, well, so do a lot of people. And a lot of them don't go and do other things like what you did. CPS, P, CPTSD is one of those things like with BPD where the trope of being abusive just gets levied so easily. Yeah, and it's wrong. It's stupid. And it's because of people like Joss Whedon because they think that if they blame everything on, on, on CPTSD that it means that they didn't do anything wrong. And they can just use that as an excuse. And some people let them get away with that. But it's not. It's not an excuse. It can explain... It can explain why you why you came to some decisions, but that doesn't excuse you from the, the need to make those things right. Yeah, sorry I stabbed you, but I'm autistic. Yeah, I'm um I'm literally neurodivergent and a minor. That's what he's doing. That is what Joss Whedon is doing in this article, and nobody buys it, especially at this point. I mean, I'm sure there's some who do, but I feel like they have motivated reasoning at this point. Yeah, it's self-absolving. It's terrible. When he was, oh, this is where it gets really weird, okay? I heard about this part. This is the only part I've seen before reading this article. When he was five, a four-year-old boy, the son of family friends, disappeared on his parents' property upstate. Eventually, his body was found. He had drowned in a pond. Years later, as a teenager, Whedon remembered he had called the boy over to the pond in order to play with him. After getting bored, he walked away, leaving the young boy alone in, at the water. I didn't think it was my fault. I knew I was five, but it just doesn't disappear as like I thought. It took him another 30 years before another thought dawned on him. Even after the incident, his parents never taught him to swim. There was no structure. There was no safety. What? What? Like this is this is just disjointed. Okay, so when he was five, he called he invited a four year old over to swim in the pool. He and and the takeaway was that he never learned how to swim himself, and that's what he took away from the experience. I I again just what the fuck. His parents split up when he was nine. At 15, he went to an all-boys boarding school in England where he read more Shakespeare, joined the fencing team, and struggled to make friends. I was very dark and miserable, this hideous little homunculus who managed to annoy everyone. Oh my god. Literally just... Oh, I was... I was I'm such a tortured artist, and everybody just found me annoying. They just didn't understand. Joker... Like, literally Joker behavior. He told the author of Joss Whedon, the biography. Then, in 1983, his fortunes changed. He had arrived at Wesleyan University, where he discovered his artsy, angsty personality could actually be attractive to women. He got a girlfriend, traded his basic name for a more interesting one, and found a mentor, the eminent film scholar Janine ba Bassinger. Bassinger, a sort of campus Svengali, surrounded herself with acolytes, Michael Bay, D.B. Weiss, in one of her books, A Woman's View, she espoused the artistic merits of the woman's picture, a genre that predominated in the middle of the 20th century. The heroines of this film led fabulous lives as successful single girls in the workplace until just before the closing cr credits, when they gave it all up for marriage. Seen from one angle, these movies promoted sexist conventions. From another, they celebrated li women's liberation. Bassinger argued they did both, and she perceived this ambigu ambiguity made them interesting because it reflected the messiness of the human mind. This insight stayed with Whedon, who had no trouble understanding how messy the mind could be. 
He admired strong women, yet his mother, yet he discovered he was capable of hurting them, usually by sleeping with them and ghosting or whatever. Oh my fucking god. I'm so, I'm so dangerous. I'm so, oh my god. If I, I can hurt these, these amazing women, these, these vaginas, these powerful creatures of, of reproduction, and I... A, 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 a tortured artist, homunculus, can hurt them? I had never believed that. I never believed that women were humans before. That my darkness could leak outside. Holy fuck. He would later tell his biography biographer that this duality gave him an advantage over girls in his college class on feminism when it came to discussing relations between the sexes i have seen the enemy he says he's in my brain uh. i'm borf i'm borf that is that is the most, I, I don't even know, I don't know how you can get more, like, soy-facing male feminist than that. This was what the liberals put forward. Holy fuck. After Wesleyan, Whedon moved to L.A. where he met Cole and wrote the screenplay for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the 1992 film directed by Fran Rubel Kazooie. He wanted to tell a story about someone who turns out to be important despite the fact that no one takes that person seriously. It took me a long time to realize that I was writing about me, he told me, and that my feeling of powerlessness and constant anxiety was at the heart of everything. His avatar was not a fearful young man, however, but a gorgeous girl with extraordinary courage. He wanted to be her, and he wanted to fuck her. In 1995, executives at the fledgling WB Network invited him to turn the idea into a series. Building on his original premise, he reimagined the monsters as metaphors for the horrors of adolescence. In one climactic scene, Buffy loses her virginity to a vampire who has been cursed with having a soul. The next morning, his soul is gone and he's lusting for blood. Any young woman who'd gone to bed with a seemingly nice guy only to wake up with an asshole could relate. So, oh, nice guys. Oh, yeah, see, you go to the jocks. Oh, you should have picked the Joss Whedon. Oh, oh. Uh. Like those women's pictures Basinger had written about, the show invited a multiplicity of interpretations. You could view it a story as a female empowerment or as the opposite, the titillating tale of a woman in leather plants who, pants who was brutalized by monsters. When it came out, critics mostly read it as the former. It was the late 90s, after all. In 1998, shortly after Buffy's second season aired, Time published an infamous co cover asking, Is feminism dead? As the story's author, G Ginia Belafonte, noted, the protests of the 60s and 70s were long over. Gloria Steinem was defending Bill Clinton in the New York Times, and the struggles for equal pay and childcare had been subsumed by the corporate page pageantry of girl power, the glib spectacle of powerful women on TV. Buffy was actually far more complex than most of the other examples of this phenomenon. As in so much of Whedon's work, the lines between good and evil were blurred. The good guys did sometimes did monstrous things, and the monsters could occasionally do good. Wow, guys. Such deep. Oh, my fucking God. We live in a cultural fucking desert. Do you understand the abhorrent state of affairs? Hey, guys. True literature. You know, it's real. But guys, 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 guys. Uh, 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 Amogus is, is true literature because sometimes the imposter is sus and sometimes... You're the imposter, and it's complicated. It's like it's in your mind. You know, it talks about the inherent nature of humanity's depth. You know? You know what I'm saying? Is what I'm saying clear? <sighs> anyway, media likes a story with a clear-cut hero, and Whedon wasn't above playing that part. I just got tired of seeing women being the victims, he told LA Times in 2000. I needed to see, see women taking control, as he victimized women IRL. In those early days of the internet, before nerd culture swallowed the world, fans flocked to message boards set up by the WB to analyze Buffy with obsessive zeal of Talmudic scholars. 
Whedon knew how to talk to these people. He was one of them. He would visit the board at all hours to complain about his grueling schedule or to argue with fans about their interpretations of his work. Back then, as he pointed out to me, the internet was a friendly place. Yeah, okay. And, he, and the quick-witted Prince of Nerds had the advantage of it. At one point, fans became convinced Buffy and another Slayer Faith were romantically intertwined. After Whedon shot down the theory accusing its proponents of seeing a lesbian subtext behind every corner, one of the posters, Buffy Nerd, sent him a link to her website where she had published a meticulous exegesis of the relationship. He returned to the message board to applaud her, sort of. By God, I think she's right, he declared, dropping the facetious tone he conceded she had made some good points. I say BYO subtext, he proclaimed, coining a phrase that fans would recite like scripture that's embarrassing that is so fucking embarrassing occasionally some of the buffy stars and writers would gather at whedon's house to watch episodes they'd huddle around his computer log on to the board and chat hey once allison hannigan who played buffy's friend willow posted her number to the website she was moving to a new apartment the next day but planned to keep her old landline connected to an answering machine so posters could leave her message one fan called so quickly he caught her before she had a chance to even set up the machine that is so cringy every year the regular posters would hold an irl party where whedon would make an appearance brian bonner one of the organizers recalled running into him outside of one of these events bonner suggested he use the vip entrance but whedon shook his head no no i'm good it's fine bonner recalled he was always this approachable down-to-earth guy Another organizer, Allison Beatrice, who wrote a book about the Buffy fandom, described the annual gathering as a sort of family reunion. Many found their closest friends through the fan community. One of the most appealing ideas in the show was that a group of social outcasts could come together to form a chosen family. When we meet Buffy, her father is absent, her mother is distracted by work, and she's isolated by the lies she has to tell to cover up her life as a slayer. At school, she falls in with a gang of nerdy friends who know who she really is. Together, they take on evil teachers, bad boyfriends, and goat-horned demons, saving the world and one another again and again. Fans believed Whedon had found his chosen family, too. Behind the scenes of the show, they all love so much. But chosen families are not necessarily spared the strife that can plague any family. True! I felt very conflicted with the fans, one Buffy act actress told me. I didn't have the same feeling about the show, but I also know sometimes people don't want your truth. She believed people hadn't been ready to hear about what Whedon, what Whedon was actually like on the set. There was a cult of silence around that sort of behavior. For those who just came in, we are reading a detailed article about Joss Whedon as a part of our uh, continued coverage of, uh, of, of pop culture uh, depravity is the best way to put it. The depravity that's, that, that writhes under the skin of, of the American entertainment industry like uh, fucking maggots. Like Joss Whedon. You know, these dudes who get into positions of power and uh, and and are protected there forever while they do horrible shit to people. That's what we're doing right now. We're anti weedening the unjossening. What's sad? What's sad? Is that I used to like a lot of Joss Whedon stuff, too. Like, I wasn't like a super fan. I really liked Firefly. But see, unlike many others, it's very easy for me to go, wow, this stuff was kind of cringe and it's okay to not like think it was great. Firefly was fun, but had so many problems. Yeah, like the fact that it was never fucking done. Everybody liked Firefly because they were excited for where it was going to go. And it just ended. There were a couple of really good episodes. Um, Out of Gas is like the one that sticks out as the best one. Um, The episode where they run out of gas in the ship is a fucking... That was a sick-ass episode. Still good to this day. Whedon was 31 when he began running Buffy. He had never run a show before and had never been a boss of any kind. At first, when crew members would hold the door open for him, he would do an awkward dance and insist he hold the door for them. It just felt so fucking wrong. Then one day in the third season, a crew member neglected to hold the door and Whedon walked straight into it face first. Oh, I see. You did get used to it. This guy thought that was going to be... This guy thought... That was going to be, that was going to come across as like, as, as like funny and, and approachable. And it just comes off as like Mark Zuckerberg. So check this out. Boop. Now that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> you did. You, I don't know. Like I, this whole piece so far has just been a guy self-reporting constantly. He's like, you know, when I first started, you know, somebody would open the door for me, and and I was like, you don't have to worship me, dude. I'm just, you know, I'm just the boss of the set. And so I would hold it for them. But then over time, you know, you just get used to it. You remember you are the boss. You are the god. And then it slaps you in the face, you know? Because you have to not lose yourself. When you're a god, you have to remember to, like, reach down and remember the people below you. You know? By the next year, he would be running two shows at once, Buffy and Angel. Soon, he added Firefly to the mix. He spent his days racing between the sets and the writers' rooms, exerting control over countless aspects of the productions from the story arcs down to the details of makeup and wardrobe. One actor described him as a huge, pulsating brain. There were a thousand things he was turning turning into every moment. He could, he could, he could make the slightest adjustment, and the scene would go from a three to a ten. Holy fuck. A sort of cult of personality formed around Whedon. Once a month, he would invite his favorite cast and crew members to his house. They would hold Shakespeare readings in the amphitheater that Cole, an architect, had built in their backyard. It was like being a part of this little family, said an actress who was in the inner circle for a time. One Buffy writer recalled Whedon signing posters for every member of the writing staff. They stood around as he bestowed each of them with personalized words of wisdom like a guru on a hill. Scenes like this were not uncommon. The standard reaction to Joss was worship. Even people who didn't worship him told me working with him could be a wonderful experience. Miracle Laurie, an actress on Whedon's 2009 series Dollhouse, was a size 12 when she got the job. Whedon told her not to go on a diet. He was to try trying to show that a size 12 woman is normal, sexy, beautiful, and strong. I still get people coming up to, to me saying how much it meant to them. I felt celebrated by him. Like I, like many I interviewed, she was surprised to hear her colleagues felt differently. But looking back, she remembered glimpsing another side of Whedon. I saw his kindness and his good intentions, and I also saw the snarkiness, the fickleness, where I would not want to be on the other side. Yeah, this is called, like, this is really downplaying here. Oh, he was snarky and fickle. Yeah, no, it wasn't just snarky and fickle. Like, literally all of your coworkers have come out and said that he was being fucking horrible to them. But, you know, people really don't want to, like, people don't want to rock the boat, you know? Buffy costume designer Cynthia Bergstrom call, recalled an incident that happened during the filming of season five. In one episode, Spike asks a sadistic science nerd to create a sex robot version of Buffy the Slayer. Whedon and Geller did not agree on what the Buffy bot should wear. Sarah was adamant about it being a certain way, Bergstrom said. The costume she wanted was a bit grandma-ish, a pleated skirt and a high neck. He definitely wanted it to be sexier. On the day Geller tried tried the different options, Whedon grew frustrated. I was like, Joss, let's just get her dressed, Bergstrom recalled. He grabbed my arm and dug in his fingers until his fingernails imprinted in, in, my, in the skin, and I said, you're hurting me. What the fuck? All of this because he wanted to make... Uh, uh, he wanted to make Sarah Michelle Geller wear something sexier fucking insane a firefly a firefly writer remembered him belittling a colleague for writing a script that wasn't up to par instead of giving her notes privately he called a meeting with the entire writing staff it was basically 90 minutes of vicious mockery josh pretended to have a slide projector and he read her dialogue out loud and pretended he was giving a lecture on terrible writing as he went through the slides and made funny voices funny for him at least the guys were looking down at their pages and this woman was fighting tears the entire time. I've had my share of shitty showrunners, but the intention to hurt, that's the thing that stands out for me now. What the absolute... For Firefly, by the way. A, a show that has like 10 funny jokes that anybody remembered over an entire series. Worth fucking shredding into and publicly humiliating for 90 minutes a, a, a junior show writer. For fucking Firefly. You know, when I joke about, like, people, like, going to war to die for Funko Pops, I'm not kidding, right? You know I'm not kidding even, like, a little bit. Like, that's, like, that's, like, the, 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 uh, it's more stark, I think, when I say that people, like, are destroying the entire planet for Funko Pops. But this is the shit I'm talking about, right? All of this is justified for, for to produce fucking Firefly? Really? You really don't think we could do better without this type of shit tied to it? 
You really don't think that like this entire self-justifying, hyper-hierarchical, uh, profit-obsessed art industry, do you really think it's producing things that, that are so valuable that it justifies the constant crushing of every people, every person involved in that, specifically women and minorities? Isn't this such a doomer story? I know. I'm trying to make it funny, but it's so hard. It's like it's like t the last five to ten years. No, more than that. The last like 15 years of pop culture all just being condensed down into a spear and jammed into your brain to tell you this shit is fucking terrible. And the sooner that you like, I don't know, denounce this shit and stop worshipping the fucking hero worshiping the nerds that that put themselves on the top of this stuff the sooner the artists who actually make these things passable can go do things they actually care about because basically all of our entire culture is is centered around the narcissistic visions of like 10 fucking millionaires and that's like all of our culture and so we end up with all these fucking stupid stories that are desperately saved by a bunch of like small writers and VFX people and and lighter lighting people and camera workers and actresses and actors who like desperately work to make these things say things of value. Meanwhile, people like Joss Whedon sit at the top and collect the worship of a thousand idiotic nerds. A high level member of the Buffy production team recalled Whedon's habit of writing really nasty notes, but that wasn't what disturbed her the most about working with him. Whedon was rumored to be having affairs with two young actresses on the show. One day, he and one of the actresses came into her office while she was working. She heard a noise behind her. They were rolling around on the floor making out. They would bang into my chair. How can you concentrate? That was gross. This happened to me more than once. These actions proved he had no respect for me and my work. She quit the show even though she had no other job lined up. This is a production team member. Then there were the alleged incidences of two Buffy actresses wrote about on social media last year. Michelle Trachtenberg, who'd played Buffy's younger sister, claimed there'd been a rule forbidding Whedon from being alone in a room with her on set. Whedon told me he had no idea what she was talking about, and Trachtenberg didn't want to further elaborate. One person who worked closely with her on Buffy told me an informal rule did exist, though it was possible that Whedon wasn't made aware of it. Well, that would make sense, that you wouldn't tell the guy that you're trying to keep the children apart from. By the way, Michelle Trachtenberg and multiple other actors who would have been very closely involved with Michelle Trachtenberg confirmed her story. So while Whedon um, uh, and this writer weren't able to confirm it, other people said that was the case. During the seventh season, when Trachtenberg was 16, Whedon called her into his office for a closed-door meeting. The person does not know what happened, but recalled that Trachtenberg was shaken afterwards. An adult in Trachtenberg's cir circle created the rule in response. Michelle Trachtenberg has talked about this and says she's not really interested in telling all of the things, but that she was mistreated by Whedon. Let's just put it that way, okay? That's what she was willing to, to talk about. And again, other people who were there at the time, verified that they remembered Michelle Trachtenberg at age 16 bring, being concerned and disturbed that day. So other people have corroborated her story. The story of Whedon's conflict with Carpenter is less obscure. The actress has been talking about it with fans and reporters for more than a decade. The tensions with Whedon developed well before her pregnancy. By her own account, she suffered from extreme anxiety and struggled to hit her marks and memor memorize her lines. Whedon, obsessed with word-perfect dialogue, was not always patient. After she moved over to Angel, she got a tattoo of a rosary on her wrist, even though her character was working for a vampire, a creature repelled by crosses. Another time, she chopped off her long hair in the middle of filming an episode. In her Twitter post, Carpenter seemed to to blame Whedon for her performance problems. She wrote that his cruelty intensified her anxiety. She got the tattoo, she explained, to help her feel spiritually grounded in a volatile work environment. Whedon acknowledged he was not as civilized back then. I was young, he said. I yelled, and sometimes I had to yell. Or sorry, you had to yell. There is, he's just excusing the fact that he screamed at people. This was a very young cast, and it was easy for everything to turn into a cocktail party. He said he would never intentionally humiliate anyone. If I'm upsetting anybody, it will be a problem for me. The costume designer who said he'd grabbed her arm? Well, I don't believe that, he said. I know I would get angry, but I was never physical with people. By the way, other people have reported him doing similar things. 
Had he made out with an actress on the floor of somebody's office? Well, that seems false. I don't understand that story even a little bit. He removed his glasses and rubbed his face. I should run to the loo. When he came back, he said the story didn't make sense to him because he lived in terror of his affairs being discovered. Dude. No, no, no. No, I didn't fuck on the floor of your office because I, I was I was terrified of people discovering all of the affairs I was having in the context with young members of staff. Dude, this guy is self-reporting left and right! The, the self-reports are off the wall! No, no, no. I, ha I was having all these affairs, but not that one in my cast of women who are mostly underage or not mostly but a lot of whom were underage nice nice dude he had some regrets about how he spoke with carpenter after learning she was pregnant i was not mannerly he said keep in mind that was when he asked if uh, she was going to get rid of her baby for the show still he was bewildered by her account of their relationship most of my experiences with with charisma are delightful and charming she struggled sometimes with her lines but nobody could hit a punchline harder than her I asked if she had called her uh, I asked if he had called her fat when she was pregnant I did not call her fat he quickly replied of, of course I didn't but he did call other pregnant women fat fat Rebecca X as she asked to be called was known as Rebecca Rand Kirshner when she wrote for the last three seasons of Buffy since then she has dropped her patriarchal last name she saw Whedon at a photo shoot a few years after the show ended when she, she when she was weeks away from giving birth I was hap birth I was happy to see Joss, and the first thing he said to me was, Oh, you're fat, she told me. She knew he was joking, but she didn't find it very funny. Did it hurt me? Yes. Did I say, Hey, I got a baby in there. What's your excuse? In so many unsaid words, yes. But I think he was actually I think he was actually slim at that point. My point is, it was a dick move, but I wouldn't call it abuse. What a burn. Yeah, fucking burn. One day, I took a walk with Rebecca X around the Huntington Botanical Gardens near Pasadena, California. She wore dark glasses and a Hermes scarf tied around her gold, dark gold hair and spoke with an inflection that called to mind the mid-Atlantic accent of an old-fashioned Hollywood star. I had reached out to her after hearing Whedon had made her cry in the writer, writer's room. In the months leading up to our meeting, she had sent me a series of probing emails, excavations of long-buried memories. Once she was in the middle of pitching an idea when Whedon placed his hands on the back of her chair. Keep going, he told her, as he tilted the chair backward and lowered her to the ground. Is that a toxic environment? She asked me. I don't know. What, what is normal behavior and what isn't? I think that's pretty fucking weird. As she led me down the winding garden path of the terrace of shared delights in the pavilion for washing away thoughts, she, alterna she alternated between criticizing Whedon, questioning her reasons for criticizing him, and questioning her reasons for questioning those reasons. Yes, she said. She had once burst into uncontrollable tears after Whedon gave her notes on a script outline, but she couldn't say for certain whether this was his fault. The writer's room was as rowdy as a pirate ship. She and the other writers would spend all day sitting around on chintz couch couches making one another laugh while plumbing their most, pa their most painful memories for story ideas. Ideas. They would fuck her. They would fuck with each other, and Whedon would fuck with them too. Though if you ever fucked with me, Whedon, he would get mad. Did he approach giving notes in a way that was healthy and consistent with the ideals of the endeavor? She wondered. No, he's a blunt, blunt instrument, but I'm a very delicate receiver. She'd always thought the people who worshipped him had it wrong. I thought he was a false god. She said. I talked about Joss as if he were a human, and people gave me shit for it. Still, she worried. She wondered if those who'd been hurt by him had misunderstood him. Whedon was not the first boss in the history of moving pictures to make a writer cry. On his sets, the budget was tight and the hours were long. Everyone was exhausted. By many accounts, Whedon didn't always clearly convey, convey exactly what he wanted. A Buffy writer once spent a week researching Irish folklore because it was unclear that Whedon had been kidding when he said he wanted to do an episode about leprechauns. Irish, oh yeah, he he didn't tell them that they didn't he didn't actually want an episode about leprechauns. Joss is a layered and complex communicator, one longtime collaborator told me. His tone is deflecting. Hmm. It's funny. It's got wordplay, rhyme, quote marks, some mumbles, self-deprecation, a comic book illusion, a Sondheim illusion, and some words they only use in England. This means you, the recipient, have to do some decoding. You have to decide if there was a message in there that was meant meant to correct you, sting you, rib you affectionately, or shyly praise you. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a fucking bad communicator. That sounds like somebody who's completely unwilling to ever consider that the things they say might be bothersome to other people, but always want other people to be to be extremely careful towards them. Holy fuck. Can a person have many bad parts and yet another person they encounter only experiences the good parts? Rebecca mused in one of her emails. Can we miss the bad parts of people? I know we can. Did I? 
She went on, Joss was just a, a dweeb and Joss was sharp as hell and Joss was a dick. But to me, he wasn't a toxic dick. He was the kind of a dick a person is on the path to becoming someone better. I did believe that. A few days later, she sent me a text. Joss is a beautiful person, but you know what? I'm actually particularly vulnerable to abusive people. Oof. Ouch. He's a concern bully. He's a cry bully. Yeah, basically. No. Jesus. On our second day of interviews, I asked Whedon about his affairs on the set of Buffy. He looked worse than he had the day before. His eyes were faintly bloodshot. He clearly hadn't slept well. I feel fucking terrible about them. He said, this is going to get really fucked. Just as a warning, everybody. Oh, boy. When I pressed him on why, he noted it messes up the power dynamic. But he didn't expand on that thought. Instead, he quickly added that he had felt he had to sleep with them, that he was powerless to resist. I laughed. I'm not actually joking, he said. He had been surrounded by beautiful young women, the sort of women who had ignored him when he was younger, and he feared if he didn't have sex with them, he would always regret it. Looking back, he feels shame and horror. I thought of something he had told me earlier. A vampire, he said, is the exalted outsider, a creature that feels like less than everybody else and also kind of more than everybody else. There's this insecurity and arrogance. They do a little dance. Holy fuck. Buffy ended in 2003, but his affairs did not. He slept with empl employees, fans, and colleagues. Eventually, his wife found out. In 2012, they split up. In Cole's open letter to fans, she accused him of using feminism as a cover for his, his infidelities. He always had a lot of female friends, but he told me it was because his mother raised him as a feminist, so he just liked women better. Oh, God! She wrote, after learning he had been deceiving her for 15 years, she was diagnosed with complex PTSD, the same condition as him. I want the people who worship him to know that he is human. I spoke with three women who dated Whedon after his marriage ended. In their stories, he was not the hero they had read about in the press, the one who wanted to see women in control. He was more like the cold-blooded men he depicted in his work. Sarah, a pseudonym, met Whedon when he was promoting Age of Ultron. She was a 22-year-old freelance writer who interviewed him for a pop culture website. After the piece published, they began a sexual relationship. He led me to believe he was single, single he, she said. One night, she went out for drinks alone with a friend Whedon wanted her to meet. After the friend mentioned he had a long-term boyfriend, Sarah asked what his name was. And she said, I'm dating Joss Whedon, the, wo the woman replied. Sarah went to the bathroom and threw up. What the fuck is he playing at? She remembers thinking. Aaron Shade, a television writer who moonlights as a psychic medium, got involved with Whedon in 2013 while working as a showrunner's assistant on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., a series he created with one of his younger half-brothers and the brother's wife. He was 49, she was 23, and a virgin. One day, Whedon texted her with an unusual request. Would she come over to his house for the weekend to watch him write? He would pay $25 hundred dollars more than shade had ever made in a month as an assistant there was one caveat she had to hide it from her bosses they died it they dated off and on in secret for nearly a year before she slept with him not long after he sent her a brief email telling her he couldn't have a girlfriend six years later he made a 10-hour youtube series called aaron the snake whisperer that chronicled the painful consequences of that relation a relationship sorry she made that Surrounded by candles and crystals, she described their relationship as an abuse of power. People like Joss offset their trauma on other people in exchange for their energy and take their energy to keep going, to keep themselves alive almost. That's why she's so that's why he's so good at the vampire narrative. Whedon says he should have handled the situation better. A lot of shit. Do you see why? I, I, I uh, feel like reading these articles is kind of important when we're talking about these people who have huge amounts of prominence in our culture. It's a sad state of affairs, honestly. It really is. I'm running out of emotes? Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. And, like, again, remember, this is coming on the heels, you know, relatively speaking, of all the Me Too allegations. This is how just deeply riven. Uh, uh, the basically, basically every large money industry in America is right now. It's really fucked. 
And these guys control huge amounts. Like in this case, this guy is able to get access to all of these people despite just having his name slapped onto everything. Oh boy, here we go. All right, here's where we're, we're going to have to have some discourse here. When Arden Lee met Whedon in 2012, she was a sex educator in her 20s and the author of A New Rules of Attraction, a book about being a female pickup artist. She picked him up at a club. After their second date, Whedon sent her DVDs of Dollhouse. The heroine, played by Buffy alum Eliza Dushku, has no friends, no family, no personality. A secret corporation has used advanced technolo technology to erase her memory and turn her into a doll, a living robot customized to cater to the darkest desires of the company's wealthy clients. Some critics argue Argued the premise was sexist, but Lee, who'd worked as a professional dominatrix, related to the dolls and was moved by Whedon's depiction of them. She and Whedon began a relationship uh, as an owner and a doll, and for the first part, she found it gratified. She found it gratifying, and she believed he did too. Whedon told Lee he identified with the character in Dollhouse, Topher, the nerdy scientist who imprints the dolls with their personalities. It's not a flattering comparison. As one of Topher's colleagues points out, he was picked to work at the dollhouse because he had no morals. You always had thought of people as playthings. This is not a judgment. You always take good care of your toys. That last line is disingenuous. Topher doesn't take good care of his dolls, and in the end, according to Lee, neither did Whedon. On Dollhouse, she reminded me bad dolls are banished to the attic, a room where they're forced to relive their worst nightmares over and over. In her epilogue to the new rules of attraction, Lee wrote that one of her worst memories was of a boyfriend breaking up with her on her birthday. Whedon read the book, and they talked about the epilogue. In 2015, hours before her birthday, he came over to her house and told her that her relationship was over. If he was... If he was like, what could I do to Arden that would would be her worst nightmare? That would have that would have been it, she said. Joss destroyed a beautiful thing just to show he had the power to. That's literally everything you need to know about him. Wow. It's a lot. You notice there's a, a trend with every single one of the people he's involved with. It, it's not even about the cruelty aspect because obviously we can talk about this is where I said we we're going to have discourse because I knew I, I had a feeling that people were going to talk about the doll thing. Um, that is mind rape. What the fuck? Yeah. OK, so let's talk about a couple things here. Let's take a look at the pattern of relationships that Joss Whedon tends to have and that have been discussed here. What we've seen is that Joss Whedon tends to not only go for significantly younger women, but that he goes for younger women who are inexperienced in their field and also don't really have much money. And even in the cases where he doesn't, like, for example, here, I mean, in this particular case, let's see, early 20s. Actually, that's not true. The sex educator, Arden Lee, was in her early 20s. She had written a book, and she had, like, a small career of, of taught about being a p female pickup artist. So she probably didn't have much money either or stability. So... What we've seen here, and, and it's interesting because I would consider a, a owner and doll relationship to be a rather, a rather powerful dynamic as far as like, uh, like BDSM or relationship dynamics go. That's pretty extreme, right? An owner and a doll is, it, I mean, I think it's fucking cool. I think that shit's great. I'll be, I'll put my cards on the table. Obviously you all know this. However, um, there is a reality, which that is a, a, uh, a, you know, particular dynamic, um, that's pretty strong and it's pretty extreme, which means that the consensual aspect has to be even stronger, lest you end up in a situation like this, right? It's quite clear from her retelling that as in his previous relationships, Whedon had no respect for the boundaries or desires of his partner. And that is like the biggest failing ever. 
it, it really is. If you're engaging in a dynamic of owner and doll, that is an extreme d dynamic that rec that is can only be built on incredible amounts of trust and mutual respect. And going and, and reading somebody's book to try and deduce their worst nightmare so that you can replace it to recreate a room from your show when it's pretty clear that that's not what this person wants out of that relationship is pretty fucking bad. It is the ultimate failing. Yeah, that is the ultimate failing that you can do in like a BDSM circumstance is to is to break that trust. The relationship doesn't matter. You're just using words at that point. So the entire thing behind a dynamic is how you build a a mutually respectful and and trusting relationship so that you can push your own boundaries together safely. So that you can engage in things that would otherwise be not possible in other types of relationship. I think that's a pretty fucked thing to do to somebody. Especially because the way he did it was to end the relationship that way. Literally not even possible. Like, it's so bad. What the fuck? I, I just remembered that that was like how he actually broke up with her. He didn't just do that as a stunt. Whedon didn't want to talk about his relationship with women in any detail, but it was possible to infer from various remarks he made throughout our conversations that he'd been aware, at least to some extent, of the pain he had caused. The year his marriage ended, he saw the Globe's production of Richard III, with Mark Rylance playing the conniving, sadistic, charismatic aristocrat who slaughters everyone in his path to the throne and winks at the audience while he does it. Richard is an ugly hunchback. Women have always rejected him. His own mother loathes him. As he seeks the crown, he tricks women into bed and has them murdered when he no longer has use for them. He appears devoid of empathy, but in one of the play's final scenes, he awakens, tormented by fear, and for the first time displays a pang of remorse. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. I am a villain. Yet I lie. I am not. As Whedon quoted from that scene, he let out a choked groan and mimicked the act of plunging a knife into his stomach. It just reached into my fucking guts, he said. He confessed that he identified more closely with Richard than any other character in Shakespeare's canon, with the possible exception of Falstaff, the holy foo fool. <sighs> Blistering blistering narcissism. Whedon's experience of seeing Richard III coincided with his own coronation of a kind. He had just directed Marvel's Avengers, a commercial juggernaut featuring an all-star cast led by Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, and Scarlett Johansson. In a profile pegged to its release, GQ hailed Whedon as the most invent inventive pop storyteller of his generation. Disgusting. By then, he had influenced an entire generation of TV creators. His delight in quirky language, <laughs> that happened. His playful subversion of genre, of genre conventions, a woman. His affinity for powerful female protagonists, a woman. You could observe these hallmarks reflected in any number of shows that arrived in Buffy's wake, from Veronica Mars to Battlestar Galactica and Lost. Dude, okay, Lost was is so much better written than Buffy, it's ridiculous. And that is including the ending seasons, which made no fucking sense. Lost's character ri writing is a hundred times better than Buffy's. Are you fucking kidding me? Lost had multiple female characters, all of whom were strong in their own way, complex, not hyper-stereotyped, and actually got interesting screen time. No, no, no. Lost had multiple good seasons. Is Lost worth watching? Yes. Watch the entire show all the way up to the episode called The Constant. And once The Constant is over, cry and never watch the show again. The Constant is legitimately one of the most beautiful episodes of TV that has ever been made. That episode made me cry so fucking hard. Also, Lost, um, the, 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 the first two seasons of Lost, uh, uh, John Locke's arc in, uh, in, in season one and two is beautiful. And John Locke's episodes are also fucking fantastic. The last season of Lost is, it was lost. Let's put it that way. They were lost.
But anyway, this is a diversion. As the culture around him continued to change, certain fans began to see Whedon's work through a more critical lens, d discerning an attitude towards women that seemed unenlightened by the standards of the female-centered shows and movies his success had in some cases helped spawn. In 2017, the same year Cole published her letter, an old Wonder Woman screenplay he had written surfaced online. Compared with the Wonder Woman movie Patty Jenkins had recently directed, his version struck some readers as creepy and sexist, with passages that seemed to linger gratuitous gratuitously on the Amazon sex appeal. You cannot tell me Joss Whedon didn't write the original Wonder Woman script while furiously cranking his cog, one woman tweeted. Yeah, ha I don't know if we've watched that on here. It was embarrassing. The, um, the original script got leaked and it was like, it, there was literally like a paragraph describing how fucking, oh, fucking sexy Wonder Woman was. So bad. That year, Whedon took a job doing rewrites for the Warner Bros. film Justice League, a DC property directed by Zack Snyder. We covered this as well. For two white men in their 50s making comic book flicks, he and Snyder could hardly have been less creatively or philosophically aligned. Oh yeah, Zack Snyder basically, he's never said it directly, but he's indicated that he basically fucking hates Whedon. Like, Zack, okay, Zack Schneider is like, he's like the, the, the problematic good guy in this story. All those years of Zack Schneider being like, yeah, we're making the most innovative films ever since 300 really changed cinema forever. And and it, behind the scenes, Zack Schneider's like, God, I fucking hate that little fucking rapey doughboy. Arrgh! That's Snyder. Like, literally, he, people have asked him about fucking um, Joss Whedon, and he's just been like, I prefer. He basically did the, I'm not going to open my mouth because if I say anything, I'm going to get in trouble. Hey, there you go, Mr. Miss Nibiru. There you go. I haven't watched the Snyder Cut. How much better than the other cut can it be? It's DC. From what I've heard, the Snyder Cut is significantly better than the original. Yeah, I've heard it's actually significantly better. Yeah. While Whedon's superhero epics were leavened by irony and wordplay, Snyder's were brooding and self-important, with a visual style that, that combined the artificiality of a video game with the fascist aesthetic of a Lenny Riefenstahl production. Jesus Christ! This writer really doesn't like Zack Snyder! Holy shit! Wow! Snyder's films were brooding and self-important with a visual style that combined the artificiality of a video game with the fascist aesthetic of a Lenny Riefenstahl production. Holy fuck. Snyder's fans were every bit as ardent as Whedon's had been, but his previous effort, Batman v Superman, had faltered at the box office and offended critics, with A.O. Scott going so far as to say, assert that Snyder and his corporate backers had no evident motive to produce such a joyless spectacle of power beyond their own aggrandizement. Now those backers were concerned with how their new venture was shaping up. An early screening did not reassure them. They asked me to fix it. And I thought I could help, Whedon told me. He now regards this decision as one of the biggest regrets of his life. Oh. Ah. You know, it, does, it feels just a tiny bit good. All of this, in retrospect, looking back and seeing Joss Whedon just bomb the Justice League movie really hard, only to have Zack Snyder come back and actually make it okay. Doesn't that feel... Yeah, the biggest regret of my life. That's literally, okay, uh, Joss Whedon fucking sitting here and just constantly re pivoting the conversation back to how he's such a misunderstood villain is so ridiculous. The self-centeredness is 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 out out of this fucking galaxy. But there is a little bit of satisfaction to be had in that Snyder got the last laugh here. And Snyder is clearly uh not quite as bad as Whedon, though he might be also bad. He's probably like a level two, uh, you know, sexual harasser versus like a level nine, like uh, like fucking uh, Joss. Don't make me like Snyder. You don't have to like Snyder. You can just be you can just be happy, you know, that like they clashed and one of them lost, and it was the one we liked less slightly. 
At first, the studio executives told Whedon his role would be restricted to writing and advising, but it soon became clear to Whedon that they had lost face, faith in Snyder's vision and wanted him to take full control. A representative from Warner Bros. denied this. Snyder has publicly stated he left the project to spend time with his family. His daughter had died by suicide two months earlier. Whedon, now installed in the director's chair, oversaw nearly 40 days of reshoots, a complicated and laborious undertaking. From the start, things were tense between him and the stars. It wasn't just that he wanted to impose a new vision on the work, he introduced an entirely different style of management. Snyder had given the actors exceptional license with the script, encouraging them to ad-lib dialogue. Whedon expected them to say their lines exactly as written. That didn't go down well at all. One crew member told me some actors criticized his writing. By Whedon's account, Gal Gadot, who played Win Wonder Woman, suggested that he, the director of the highest grossing superhero movie at the time, didn't understand how superhero movies worked. At one point, Whedon paused the shoot and, according to the crew member, announced that he had never worked with a ruder group of people. The actors fell silent. Surely, surely, surely it's the children who are wrong. The actors, at least some of them, felt Whedon had been rude too. Ray Fisher, a young... Hey, this, we covered this. We covered the Ray Fisher story. It's huge. And guess what? It's still raging on. For those of you who don't know, the Ray Fisher story is completely off the wall. I'm not kidding you. The, the Ray Fisher story got so out of hand that WB made a fake announcement for a fake Frosty the Snowman movie. I'm not kidding you. This is going to blow your mind. WB announced a fake Frosty the Snowman movie. That was going to be played, Frosty the Snowman was a live action remake that was going to be played by Jason Momoa as Frosty the Snowman. Now this movie was never going to be made, but they announced that it was going to be made in order to bury a story about Ray Fisher saying that he experienced a fuckload of racism on the set of Justice League. And it worked. So the, the morning that Ray Fisher's story was supposed to go out... All of the new, uh, all of the in entertainment news were talking about the Jason Momoa uh, Frosty the Snowman, and guess what happened? It backfired because Jason Momoa said, "Wait, what the fuck? I'm not in a Frosty the Snowman movie." And then everyone was like, "What? What? What was? What has to do with the Frosty the Snowman movie?" And then no one ever talked about the Frosty the Snowman movie ever again, because Jason Momoa was like, "I'm not in a Frosty the Snowman movie. What are you fucking talking about?" Anyway, go look at Ray Ray Fisher's story. I'm not kidding you. We did this. You can go watch it. We we covered this when it was fucking happening. If you go back and watch the D, the uh, Drama Mama playlist, you can hear the whole story. Jason Momoa, the Frosty the Snowman movie that didn't exist. In insanity, just it insanity. Sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. It it sounds like I made that up, but it but it's not made up. There's the Drama Mama playlist. The actors, at least some of them, felt that Whedon had been very rude, too. Ray Fisher, a young black actor, played Cyborg. It was his first major role. Snyder had centered the film on his character, the first black superhero in a DC movie, and he treated Fisher as a writing partner, soliciting his opinions on the film's representations of black people. Whedon downsized Cyborg's role, cutting scenes that, in Fisher's view, challenged stereotypes. When Fisher raised his concerns about the revisions in a phone call, Whedon cut him off. It feels like I'm taking notes right now, Whedon told him, according to the Hollywood Reporter, and I don't like taking notes from anybody, not even Robert Downey Jr., Gadoga didn't care for Whedon's style either. Last year, she told reporters Whedon threatened her and that he would make her career that he would make her career miserable. Whedon claims he did no such thing. I don't threaten people. Who does that? Who does that? I fucking hate this guy so goddamn much. This guy represents like a brand of masculinity that I hope just disappears forever. He concluded that she had misunderstood him. English is not her first language, and I tend to be annoyingly flowery in my speech. Dude. Look at us. Wow. Look at us. We'll go. And now it feels so good. Because I feel like in the first one, you worry about having your first child. I yeah. don't know how many of you here are parents. Look like we have some even grandparents here. So, that... That is how fluent Gal Gadot is. Gal Gadot barely has an accent. Like, not even, like, barely even has an accent. 
and this fucking idiot is sitting here like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, English wasn't her first language, so, you know, he probably, she probably didn't understand when I was, you know, threatening her. What a fucking fraud. What a fucking piece of shit. He recalled arguing over a scene that she wanted to cut out of the film. He told her jokingly that if she wanted to get rid of it, she would have to tie him to a railroad track and do it over his dead body. Then I was told that I had something about her dead body and tying her to the railroad track. Then I was told that I had said something about her dead body and tying her to the railroad track. Godot did not agree with Whedon's version of events. I understood perfectly what he was saying, she said to the New York. She said to the New York Times in an email. Is it Gadot? Okay. Gal Gadot? Okay. As for Whedon's claim that he doesn't threaten people, an actress on Angel told me that hadn't been true back when she knew him either. After her agent pushed for her to get a raise, she claims Whedon called her at home and said she was never going to work for him or 20th Century Fox ever again. Reading Gadot, Gadot's quote, she thought, wow, he's still using that line? Whedon denied this too. Uh-oh. This is why I hate fake professional culture breeds toxic environments and prevents any sincere criticism. Yeah, I think that's pretty, I, I, I think I've talked about that. I've talked about uh, fake professionality versus actual professionality. What is meant when people say that versus what people are talking about, like or what people mean versus what people say they mean and what what's actually good and what's not. Yeah. Ooh, you're done in this industry. Yeah, people joke about that shit all the time. Justice League premiered in the fall of 2017. It was a critical and commercial debacle. Snyder's fans blamed Whedon for its failures, accusing him, as one tweet put it, of turning Snyder's godlike heroes into clowns. The power of his fandom, a force Whedon had done so much to cultivate at the start of his career, was now wielded against him. The fans launched an elaborate campaign pressuring Warner Bros. to release the virgin version Snyder had originally planned, chartering a plane to fly a banner over Warner Studios. Just as Whedon had once used message boards to bond with Buffy obsessives, Snyder used the social media platform Vero to ra rally his followers, sharing pictures of his morning workouts alongside images that appeared to be derived from his cut of the film. Several months into the pandemic, the studio, desperate for content, announced that his cut would air on HBO Max. At an online fan event celebrating the upcoming release, Snyder declared he would set the movie on fire before using a single frame he had not filmed himself. Our lord and savior, Zack Snyder, someone wrote in the comments below the live stream. Mm. Gayfesh says this is no joke why Gates McFadden wasn't in the second season of TNG she was used to voicing her opinion in a theater situation so the producers thought she was obnoxious on set for speaking up for herself and they fired her that's so trash that's so fucking trash Around the same time, amid worldwide protests against racism, Fisher post posted a series of tweets accusing Whedon of abusing his power and charging studio executives with enabling the director. In a Forbes interview, Fisher had said he'd been he'd told Whedon uh, he'd been told that Whedon had used color correction to change an actor of color's complexion because he didn't like the actor's skin tone. Man, with everything 2020's been, that was the tipping point for me. Fisher said. Whedon was stunned. He had given the whole movie a lighter look, brightening everything in post-production, including all the faces. He said the claim that he had disliked a character's skin tone, which Forbes ultimately retracted, was for false and unjust. Whedon says he cut down Cyberg's role for two reasons. The storyline logically made no sense, and he felt the acting was bad. According to a source familiar with the project, Whedon wasn't alone in feeling that way. At test screenings, viewers deemed Cyborg the worst of all the characters in the film. Despite that, Whedon insists he spent hours discussing the changes with Fisher and that their conversations were friendly and respectful. None of the claims Fisher made in the media were either true or merited discussing, Whedon told me. Hmm, sussy there. Uh, he could think of only one way to explain Fisher's motives. We're talking about a malevolent force. We're talking about a bad actor in both senses. Notice how anyone who ever disagrees with Joss Whedon is framed as a complete villain? Hmm. Hmm. Some of Whedon's defenders proposed a theory. What if Fisher had been doing Snyder's bidding? Without furnishing proof, they speculated that Snyder had tricked Fisher into thinking Whedon was a racist. Or maybe Fisher knew perfectly well his allegations were bullshit. Either way, the actor and director had manufactured a controversy that made Snyder seem like a progressive ally, while diverting attention from the fact that their early cut had been a disaster. Except it did good. 
the, the cut did fine. Whedon's advocates believe this ad this campaign had poisoned Carpenter against Whedon, causing her to see the complicated story of their relationship as a simplistic narrative of, of abuse. Once someone lights a fuse and people see there's a flame, they run to it and throw stuff into it. One person in we Whedon's inner circle said, Snyder declined to be interviewed. Wow. This is what we call poisoning the well. Right here. Saying, oh, yeah, well, no, see, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, there was a campaign against me and, and everyone who comes out is just that, you know, they've convinced themselves that they were abused so that they can ride onto the cancel train. So stupid. In our conversations, Whedon was somewhat more circumspect. I don't know who started it. I just know in whose name it was done. Snyder's superfans were attacking him online as a bad feminist and a bad husband. They don't give a fuck about my feminism, he said. I was made a target by my ex-wife and people exploited that cynically. Yeah, you, you were made a target, bro. As he explained to this theory, his voice sank into a hoarse whisper. She put out a letter saying some bad things I'd done and saying some untrue things about me. But I had done the bad things, and so people knew I was gettable. What? Gettable? What the hell does this even mean? When Snyder's four-hour cut was finally unveiled, it was critically acclaimed. His fans poured through both films to analyze the differences. Some seized on a belief first put forth by Fisher that Whedon had intentionally erased people of color from the film. A remarkable reversal had taken place. Fifteen years earlier, Snyder's work was widely seen as the epitome of problematic cinema. His breakout effort 300, a sword and sandal epic about Persian wars, was so overtly racist in the view of the UN delegation from Iran that it threatened to incite a clash of civilizations. Okay, that's a little bit of an overstatement. Now the internet had recast Snyder as a progressive hero while branding Whedon, its progressive hero of yesterday, as a villain and bigot. The beginning of the internet raised me up and the modern internet pulled me down, Whedon said. The perfect symmetry is not lost on me. Dude, just, this guy genuinely believes he's the center of the universe. Unironic. Unironically believes that he's the center of the universe. At Whedon's house, his wife, Horton, would occasionally come into the living room bearing tea and dark chocolates. When I asked where they'd met, she said, right here. A mutual friend introduced them in the winter of 2019 after learning Whedon had brought, bought several of Horton's paintings, including a self-portrait. She was greeted by an image of herself when she walked into his home. Um... Hmm. <sighs> By then, Whedon had begun seeking treatment for sex and love addiction, along with other addictive tendencies. James Franco, Kevin Spacey, and Harvey Weinstein have all taken similar paths. Was he using a page out of some crisis management playbook? playbook? When Whedon says he's genuinely committed to the work. I decided to take control of my life, or try, he told me. The first thing I did with Heather was tell her my patterns, which was not my M.O. I couldn't shut up because I finally found somebody I found more important than me. Life was good and also bad. Having overcome the isolation and ridicule of his childhood, he found himself in the role of social outcast once more. He still had an agent but seemed like nobody wanted to work with him. At Fisher's urging, Warner had conducted a series of investigations into the Justice League production. This really frames Ray Fisher as a villain. Like, this piece is really, in my opinion, very, uh, very uncharitable to Fisher. Keep in mind that, yes, Fisher did ask for them to do an investigation, but an investigation into onset racism is kind of, like, an important thing to do. Like, what the fuck? The studio won't disclose its findings, but in late 2020, it announced a remedial action had been taken. A few weeks earlier, HBO had revealed Whedon would no longer serve as showrunner of The Nevers, his own science fiction series about women with supernatural powers. The network scrubbed his name from the show marketing materials. Over the last year, some of his fans have tried to scrub him out too, erasing him from their narratives about what made Buffy great. In posts and essays, they've downplayed his role in the show development, pointing out that many people, including many women, were critically important to its success. That's true. It may be hard to accept that Whedon would, could have understood the pain of a character like Buffy, a woman who endures infidelity, attempted rape, and endless violence. But the belief that her story was something other than a projection of his psyche is ultimately just another fantasy. Whedon did understand pain, his own. Some of that pain was, as he once put to me, spilled over into the people around him, and some of it was channeled into his art. Okay, I'm sorry. This is incredibly forgiving to the guy who has been accused of fucking a lot.
and credibly accused of a fucking lot. Whedon's, Whedon once wrote a line that could have served as a warning to all of us. In Firefly, one of the crew members, Jane, accidentally tosses the spoils of a botched robbery into the hands of the town's poor. Jane is not a good man, but when he returns to the town years later, he sees its residents have erected a statue in his honor. When he confides to the crew's captain that he's unsettled by this development, the captain just stares into the distance. It's my estimation that every man ever got made a statue of him was some kind of some, a bitch, or, some bitch or another. He says, ain't about you, Jane. It's about what they need. Nobody ever fell from a pedestal into anything but a pit, Whedon told me on a call one day, one day. A few months had passed since our conversation at his house. In that time, he'd finally made peace with himself. He said, could I have done marriage better? Don't get me started. Could I have been a better showrunner? Absolutely. Should I have been nicer? He considered the question. Perhaps he could have been calmer, more direct. But would that not have compromised the work? Maybe the problem was he'd been too nice, he said. He'd wanted people to love him, which meant that when he was direct, people thought he was harsh. In any case, he decided he was done worrying about that at all. How convenient. People had been using every weaponizable word of the modern era to make it seem like I was an abusive monster, he said. I think I'm one of the nicer showrunners that there's ever been. We did it. We made it, everybody. We made it to the other side. So that's why this is this piece that we just read here is the reason why Joss Whedon has been all over the news lately. Because a lot of people have been talking about this. And a lot of people have been angry about this particular article. You know? On one hand, I don't think this article makes Joss Whedon look good at all. On the other hand, there are sections of this where it seems like the writer is also kind of agrees with the fact that 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 um that Joss Whedon has been like mistreated by everyone it's a little weird on one hand I appreciate that we got like a very honest look into the things that he said in these interviews um but on the other hand I'm like wow like this article is really unfair to people like Ray Fisher like Ray Fisher keep in mind this this article devotes quite a lot of time to like outlining Joss Whedon's complaints about everyone who's ever had an issue with him, like him just airing those out, even though like Ray Fisher was, it's like when he was on Justice League, that was his first movie ever. And like, he didn't have, like Joss Whedon is like, oh, they're out to get me. He's, he's writing, he's, you know, he's using cancel culture or whatever, but this guy's a nobody. The reason why people backed up Ray Fisher is because one, people liked him, and two, he had a credible story with other people, other actors from the set who people also like backing him up. Not because like you know Ray Fisher was like uh, some secret guy with a bunch of influence. This guy's a new actor. Ray Fisher's a brand new actor, and he got completely fucked by Whedon like really hard. And in the process. He stated multiple times and tried to escalate multiple times because Whedon was treating him poorly and allegedly racist as well, which other people have confirmed, by the way. Another, you know, this double feature kind of feels like I kind of cheated a bit because it feels like these are pretty cut and dry, right? But I don't know. I guess what we can, what we can talk about is what do y'all think about the article? What do we think? What do we think? Do we think the article was too favorable to Joss Whedon or or was it too hard? I think it was a little too favorable personally. But not like directly. I think it was just I think it was just uncharitable. It was favorable to him by being unfavorable to his detractors. You know? I feel really bad for Michelle Trachtenberg. I do too. I do too. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people came away with it. If you look at the comments, on Twitter on this article a lot of people seem to come away with the same thing but there's also a lot of defenders I gotta say in here the Justice League actors sound so ungrateful and rude Joss was hired to fix the god-awful DC universe and they all all they could do is act like stubborn children Joss was only trying to help it's their problem if they can't follow commands from a director. He is the director. If actors don't like to be told what to do, then go into another profession. 
This is all due to Snyder giving them too much freedom on the set to do what they want with their characters. Management changes hand and the resentment settles in pretty quickly. Joss obviously had no idea what he was walking into. Notice all the hate is coming from failed actors and has-beens. Nobody from Marvel Studios has said anything bad about Joss before, while, or after writing. That's not true. Directing Avengers and Age of Ultron. Not true. Alan Tudyk even tweeted wasn't there, but I've known Joss for 17 years and honestly can't even imagine it, and I have a pretty good imagination. James Gunn liked that tweet. And yeah, Ray Fisher said, hey, like, why would you say that? Like, you do know that, like, you're downplaying in the middle of this and you're you're coming out against somebody you're coming out for somebody who who you weren't involved in the product project but i was like it was really simple alan tudyk apologized for the tweet and game james gunn apologized for liking it yeah like they did they both acknowledged that it was probably out of line Well, keep in mind, this is just an interview. Like, this is an interview for an entertainment mag. So, like, it's not like... This is not a piece that's, that's like, supposed to be the most, uh, like, even-handed thing in the world. It's an interview about a guy. It's like... It's a, you know, it's a think piece. Um, Yeah. This article seemed like it was giving way much, way too much leeway to Joss Whedon. I feel like that too, but it is possible. Um, yeah, it is. Po that's what I was about to say, Somniostatic. It is possible that it might not have gotten published if it wasn't at least somewhat favorable. Because you know, a lot of people just won't go into a circumstance where it's going to be unfavorable to them. But it's, I don't know. Again, like this just goes to this just goes to show you, like the big takeaway from all of this is that. Uh, is to be we should be a little bit more considerate of the prices that we pay for the current like status quo of of uh, of American culture that like to to get your to get your Funko Pop producing uh, ultra blockbuster films dudes like this get put in charge of thou hundreds and thousands of other people's livelihoods and well beings. Uh, and regularly abuse that power for their own personal gain in like directly to the detriment of other people for for what for justice league for the fucking hulk and uh and spider-man and i don't know wonder woman some other random shit you've never heard of from some comic you barely remember from when you were a kid or something is it really worth it? Is it really? I don't know. No money in it anymore either. What a fuck you even wanted? Why? Why would you want? It? There's no money in it. Nobody gets paid for doing it anymore. Thor is so cool. Ooh, Spider Man. Ooh, ooh I love my sci-fi. Holy shit, Joss Whedon is way the fuck too honest to be doing all this. First of all, don't do any of this. And second of all, if you do, you aren't really serving yourself by admitting it. That's the thing. He didn't even mean to admit it. He's just oblivious. He's not, he never admitted anything directly except for that one time when he said that like, he's like, oh yeah, all the affairs I was having on the set full of underage people. Um, like that part was like the most direct self-report. The rest is just like him giving off like the worst impression imaginable by being like, yeah, you know, I thought about this conflict I had with somebody else who said they were really hurt by the thing that I did. And, you know, my takeaway was just that it was really cruel of them to ruin my day by telling me they were hurt by something I did to them. You know, that's like that's like the character of all of the self reports in this. They're like these these just blatantly obvious give like red flags. And he just doesn't notice that he's saying them. Yeah. Yeah, he, just yeah, a lot of it. And the whole, the entire piece is just, oh, woe is me. I am such a misshapen, um, uh, uh, misunderstood monster man. Uh, and I'm going to continue doing exact. And then, of course, the piece ends with him saying, I'm going to do exactly what I've done, but worse. Him saying, oh, I was too nice, actually. I hope Joss Whedon never works another job in Hollywood for the rest of his life.